video, we're first going to start with a bunch of review. And I'm just going to do it really, really briefly for everything. But you need about four different concepts before you can actually get to polarity. And it's been a while since we talked about some of them, so I don't want you to forget about it. So we're going to talk about effective nuclear charge, shielding, and electronegativity first. Go back to previous videos and watch those if you need a full lecture on it. This is just going to be sort of a brief memory jog more than anything else. And then the same thing with polar bonds. We're going to talk about what makes a bond polar. We already discussed that, but it's just a real quick reminder so that you have something going into polarity. And then we'll take all of that that we already actually know, it's already review, and we're going to combine that together with the VSEPR that we did in the previous lectures to go ahead and say, okay, is this molecule polar or not? So first off, let's remember effective nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge was this idea that the more protons you have, the more your valence electrons are going to feel the charge of the nucleus. Now this only works, this only increases if you don't also increase something else that we'll talk about in a second. So as you go across the periodic table to the right, you're adding more protons, you're adding more electrons, and so it's like almost like if you made a magnet stronger and stronger and stronger and they're going to attract each other more and more and more. That's the idea behind effective nuclear charge. And this is going to have to do with electronegativity, which has to do with polar bonds, which has to do with polar molecules. So that's where we're going with this. Now, this is true as you go across the periodic table, but we learned that as you go down the periodic table, effective nuclear charge actually generally decreases. And that was because of something else called shielding. And when we talked about this in one of the supplemental videos, we talked about, oh, this is kind of like if you go to a concert and you're really, really close to the stage, you can feel that stage quite a bit. But if instead, now you have a whole bunch of people in between you and the stage, you're a long ways away, it's a little bit shielded. You're shielded from the stage by the other people. Or in the case of our atoms, our electrons that aren't actually right next to the nucleus, but are at a higher energy level, are shielded by all of the core electrons. As you get further and further and further away, and you have more and more and more energy shells shielding the further out electrons, they're even more shielded. And so this actually decreases the effect of nuclear charge, because now your electrons that are on the outside have all of these negatively charged electrons on the inside blocking the nucleus from them. And these were our reasons behind our electronegativity. Shielding means that as we go down the periodic table, our electronegativity decreases. As we go across the periodic table to the right, our effective nuclear charge increases, increasing our electronegativity. That's great, but let's remember what electronegativity is. It's this idea that, okay, if you have two atoms in a bond, it's going to steal more or less of the electron density. So if something with a very, very high electronegativity is going to take more of the electron density than something with a really low electronegativity. Now, if you had two really high electronegativity elements together in a bond, they're going to be fighting over it, and it's going to be an equal sharing. So this kind of leads us into our bond polarity, but you have to know your electronegativity first, and you have to know your trends for that first. Remember, we talked about all of this in the past couple of weeks, so if you need a better review of it, just go back and watch those lectures. So now our bond polarity. Our individual bonds will be polar if you have a difference in electronegativity. So if you have a really, really high difference in electronegativity, greater than two if we want to talk about numbers, and this really only happens if you have a metal and a nonmetal, then we have an ionic bond. We're not really going to be talking about that. We're just kind of a refresher that, hey, that, that's what happens. But what if there's no difference in electronegativity? So this may even be two really, really electronegative elements, but there's no difference between them. They're both very high. They're going to have an equal sharing because they're going to be fighting over the electron density the same. So if there's no difference in electronegativity, then there, it's nonpolar. Notice I caveat that a little bit by saying little to no difference. There are a few situations where we have very, very tiny, tiny differences, and we don't really count that as polar. But what if you have a difference that's somewhere in between the two? It's not zero, but it's not two. 
now they're not trading electrons. They're not ionic. It's not a situation where one is going to steal an entire electron away from the other. It's instead a situation where you're just going to have a slightly unequal sharing. So I picked two different examples, um, both with hydrogen for a reason. So first I have HLI. So if you go grab a periodic table, or you should always have one sitting in front of you, and you see that lithium does not have a very high electronegativity, where hydrogen does. So hydrogen steals more of the electron density. So it's a polar bond, with hydrogen having most of it. Now, on the flip side of that, and the reason why I picked this example, we have HF. So we still have hydrogen, but now, in comparison to fluorine, hydrogen actually doesn't have a very strong electronegativity. And so fluorine gets most of the electron density. Fluorine steals more of the density because it's more electronegative. Again, just kind of a quick review of bond polarity. If you don't know how to tell if a bond is polar, you're not going to be able to tell if a molecule is polar because our first question will always be, do we have polar bonds? So now let's get into a polarity, or in other words, a dipole moment. Once we know if we have polar bonds, we need to see how these interact throughout the molecule. Because sometimes polar bonds will actually cancel each other out, and even though you'll have polar bonds, you won't have a polar molecule. Now, polar and dipole, I'm using these two words almost interchangeably. And that's because if something has a dipole, it is polar. And so we kind of just interchange those two terms depending on you know, basically the particle of speech we need. How you get your dipole moment is that it is a vector addition of the magnetic moment of the polar bonds. And what does that actually mean? It's kind of a, a not super clear sentence. So the idea here, let's start with one bond. If we have one bond, it's very, very simple. If it's polar, then it's a polar molecule because there's nothing canceling anything out. So for something like HF, fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. The one and only bond is polar and therefore the molecule is polar or has a dipole. You can draw this two different ways. I drew both on the HF. So notice on top of the molecule, I have a little delta plus and delta minus. That's one way of showing it. Another way of showing it is what I did below, where I have an arrow with a plus sign. The plus sign goes on the more positive side of the molecule, and then you draw the arrow to the more negative side of the molecule. And you can use either one of these. Now, what happens if we have a multi-bond atom? To do this, we have to look at a couple of different things. Not only do we have to see if the bonds are polar, step one, but we have to see, well, where do these add? How do they add together? Bonds that are in opposite directions subtract. Bonds that are in the same direction add. So there's a really easy way to think about this where you don't have to try to break it down into x, y, z components of everything and try to think about the vector addition. It's what's happening and it's what the analogy shows you, but it's a much quicker way of thinking about it. So say we have a person. It's, it's a little bit of a morbid analogy, but it, it works well. So say we have a person and we tie ropes to them. We're going to start with a linear geometry. We'll do this for linear and um, trigonal planar, or rather bent. Um, so you can see two examples, but you can do this for anything. I just picked the two that are in one plane so that we don't have to put jetpacks on our people. So we have a linear geometry. We have people on either side of them, and they're going to play tug of war with the poor person in the center. If those two people are of equal strength, exactly the same strength, what happens to the poor person in the center? Do they go anywhere? Well, no. They're not going to go that way because the person on this side is pulling them, and they're not going to go that way because the person on this side is pulling them, and so they just sit in the center being sad. Now, the analogy here is the same as if we had an atom that had two polar bonds, or excuse me, a molecule that had two polar bonds, but both polar bonds were going in opposite directions. So something like CO2. A carbon-oxygen bond is definitely polar. Oxygen is electronegative. It's going to steal more of the electron density from the carbon. But they're going in opposite directions. And so because they're going in opposite directions, both of them are pulling the electron density apart but they're doing it equally. And so overall, it's going to be not polar. Let's do another example. Same idea, but this time one of our people is really, really strong. One of our people is really, really weak. And then we have our still sad person in the center. 
So I put some muscles on the, the, the larger person so that we can see that they're really strong. It's still linear and they're still pulling in opposite directions. But now the stronger person is going to force the entire group to go this way. Same idea with the electron density. So for example, let's take something like HCN. Our carbon nitrogen bond is going to pull our electron density to the right. And so because our carbon nitrogen bond is polar, but our carbon hydrogen bond isn't, overall it goes to the right. Let's look at another example because sometimes this one trips people up a little bit. So let's look at trigonal planar. We'll set up our same system, but now we tie three ropes to the poor person in the center. If all of these are equal, so something like an O3, and we take that person in the center and all three people are pulling them, it's not in exactly opposite directions like the linear. It's not like this person cancels this person. But you can see that all of the, what we would call vector components, are going to cancel out because they're all pulling in exactly opposite directions. And so it all cancels and you still get a nonpolar molecule. So don't let something like trigonal planar mix you up just because you can't directly say this person cancels this person or this molecule cancels this molecule. However, that doesn't mean that all trigonal planar geometries are nonpolar because all atoms don't have to be the same. So again, taking our strong person example, let's just replace out one of those people with you know, the bodybuilder or football player or something. Our analogy would be like an oxygen, something again that's very electronegative. So now we have that one polar bond that is pulling one direction and not really anything happening in the other directions. And so our analogy here is our oxygen is stealing way more of the electron density. It's pulling more density toward it and so it's going to be more negative. So you can think of your highly electronegative elements as being that sort of you know, strong person for the vector addition. Now, of course, if you're highly mathematical oriented, you just look at the vector addition and that's fine too. But this is a quick way of thinking about it. I'm not going to go through this with all of the, or all of the geometries, but make sure you can do it for the rest of them too. Um, it's just this kind of gets you the, the main concept. So let's look at one more example, this time without all of the silly tug of war issues. And I'm going to ask you, to, you to pause this and give it a shot and see what you have. So this one is going to be CLF3. Now, notice the first step to doing this is you have to write your Lewis structure, you have to determine your geometry, and then you have to decide if it's polar. So pause this and give it a shot. So first off, we've got to write our Lewis structure. And if you don't write your Lewis structure, you're going to get this wrong. This one is one of those examples where you absolutely will get it wrong if you don't have the right Lewis structure because you wouldn't know that those two electron pairs exist. So we have our two electron pairs, which gives us a steric number of five. That steric number of five gives us a T-shape. If you're having trouble and you're saying, I don't know where she's getting these geometries from, you need to go back and watch those lectures. You really shouldn't be trying this even a little bit if you don't have your geometries down first. Okay, so now once we have this T-shape, now we can say, okay, well, what's, our, what's happening with our, our vector addition here? Or picture your people flying around and, and pulling the center person around, whichever helps you out. So each one of these bonds are polar. And I've drawn the, the little dipole on both the bonds and then down below. So we can see that these are not all going to cancel out. This is not the same as the trigonal planar that I described in the previous little analogy slides because they don't all go in exactly opposite directions. The one that's pointing up in this slide and pointing down in this slide almost, all, almost cancel out. It's a little bit to the side that isn't going to cancel, but they mostly cancel. But then we're left with the one that's pointing to the left. And that one doesn't have anything to cancel with it. And so overall, we are going to have a dipole that's going the way that I have it drawn now to the side, toward the base of the T, if you want to think of it that way. And so yes, this one's going to be polar. Now, 
just want to stress, I know I mentioned at the beginning of the slide, but if you hadn't known that those two lone pairs were there, you would have thought that this was a trigonal planar geometry. And then you would have thought that it was nonpolar. So you have to make sure you have that before moving on. So in summary, our polar bonds are formed because we have a difference in electronegativity. A little bit of review, but it's important. That does not necessarily mean that you have a polar molecule. To know if you have a polar molecule, you have to first decide, are these going to cancel out? To do that, you have to have the geometry. So once you have the geometry and you know if you have polar bonds, you can decide, are the polar bonds going to cancel? If they all cancel out, it's a nonpolar molecule. But if they don't, if some of them add in the same direction, in that case, it's going to be polar.